the Sri University. Hello and a very warm welcome to Referendum TV, or as it will become Broadcasting Scotland. And today we're joined by Professor or Professori John Robertson, um, Professor of Media Politics. Welcome, John. Hi there. I mentioned the University of the West of Scotland. My my boss is very keen that we mention that. John's from the University of the West of Scotland. Or well, as we like to think of it, the University of the Best of Scotland. Excellent. Um, that, the people yeah. in Medbury University don't entirely agree with us. Yeah, so that, that ends the advertorial there. That's it. How are you? I'm good. Yourself? Yeah. I'm very well, thank you. I've yeah. just had a nice lunch and I'm ready to engage and talk. Now, you're here ostensibly because of your research findings in January, February? Yeah, January, February. came out in February. On the BBC and the identified bias that you found there. Mm -hmm. How's it been since then? It's been a, if I use the cliche, it's a roller coaster. Uh -huh. um, but it, um, it's, been a, it's been a good one. Um, initially, I, I was quite anxious um, because the BBC uh, head of corporate affairs wrote and complained about the research. The research found, in my, in my mind, an objective degree of bias, imbalance in the coverage. And uh, the, the, the head of current affairs or well, corporate affairs wrote to the, my principal and to me to accuse me of bringing the university into corporate disrepute and the BBC into corporate disrepute. I found it interesting he chose the word corporate. Uh -huh. You know, I think there are other kinds of disrepute I'd be more offended by, frankly, like ethical disrepute or something. But um, We'll maybe come on to that in a little bit. Yeah. For, for, for a couple of weeks, I was actually quite anxious. Mm -hmm. and because I didn't know how my uh, my university management would react to it. Um, I was very lucky. My, my principal, who's, a, who's an Australian, uh -huh. I don't know whether it's a factor in this, newly appointed, he took the view that academic freedom came first. And I think also he welcomed the, the kind of publicity the university was getting. So I got support very quickly. My dean, uh, Malcolm Foley, who's the, the father of James Foley, who's one of the Radical Independence campaign authors, right. um, he hugged me. He hugged me. So from then on, I started to He helped or hugged? Hugged. Hugged. He hugged me, yeah. So from then on, I started to feel a certain degree of confidence, and I got massive numbers of emails from people uh, on uh, people who read the research on the internet and actually thought that I'd understated the, the, the evidence. They were all surprised that I'd, I'd found less bias than they thought. Many of them wrote to, to thank me for doing this. I'd never had such a surge, surge of support. And they nearly all copied the principle in. And he, he phoned me one day to say, stop filling up my inbox, because he was getting hundreds of emails. That must have been quite a nice balance to the anxiety provoked by was. the BBC going for you. It was, and it just flipped the whole thing over, and I think I went from anxious to maybe just a bit too gung-ho about the whole thing, and I started to become quite confident. So, so just let's just clarify the research findings first, if yeah. we can, in a, in a digestible form. We don't need complex methodologies, because I would struggle to spell methodology, but if we get some of the background, that'd be useful, John, if you come to some of the conclusions here. I'll do that. I was actually asked to do a similar thing in March at the, at the Hollywood Education and Culture Committee, right. and I went there thinking, um, I'd just become a professor at the time, I went there thinking the, there will be supportive SNP people who um, I'll, I'll be happy to speak to you know, in, a, in a, an open, friendly way, but there'll be some assassins there from, you know, from the Labour Party and from the others. And, uh, and I took great delight in making the people from the Labour Party say Professor, whereas you know, normally I'd prefer to just be John. But I, you, you mentioned about, uh, about language and about concepts. Um, my research is definitely of a school that would be called phenomenological. So what? We're rocking it. See, big, a big fan of Edmund Husserl, who was originally a phenomenologist. Right. Who had his library tickets taken away from him by, by Martin Heidegger, which is another story. I, I managed to we're persuade off one piece. of we're, we're two minutes into the interview, <laughs> and we're going off piece into Martin Heidegger, the origins of phenomenology, and um, his betrayal through his Nazism. Fantastic. Right. Well, we'll stop. We'll stop. Okay, we'll back, stop back, to, back to Hollywood. Yeah. And one of the MSPs did have a go at seeing phenomenology. And they, they struggled a bit, and I took a, do, certain, do, do, do. Took a little pleasure in that. <laughs> but basically what it means is that, is, that, is that my approach to research is the opposite of positivism. Mm -hmm. Positivism is that, that largely kind of um, authoritarian approach where you think you kind of know what's there anyway. And research for a long time was, was, was driven by that kind of approach. And it tended just to find what it wanted to find. Mm -hmm. Phenomenology and, and a term sometimes associated with it, grounded theory, which is much easier to say, uh, grounded oh, theory yeah, is based on the idea that the researcher shouldn't have strong opinions about what they'll find. Now, we're all human, uh -huh. so I started that research, and I did think, I bet there's a bit of bias here. But, you know, it's an establishment institution. Mm -hmm. This will break up the United Kingdom if it goes ahead. Then the idea that the BBC wouldn't be at least a little biased 
I think would have been naive. But I tried as much as possible to adopt an approach where, where I look for what's there mm-hmm. rather than looking for what my preconceptions are. Mm-hmm. And I think I did that as well as it is humanly possible. I had, of course, second coders and third coders who helped me, postgraduate students. Mostly what is, what is this, what's a second coder and a third Second coder is another person uh-huh. who, who goes through the transcripts and codes it again in terms of what is biased in favour of independence, what is biased against independence and so on. And I used postgraduate students and a retired colleague for that. They, they tended to find more bias than I did. Right. I was, the, I was the, the restraining influence in all of this. But in the end, it, the main thing that people took interest in was that I found a three to two bias in terms, in terms of the amount of statements broadcast on Reporting Scotland and SDV, um, three to two against independence. Was it just those two news slots or was it things like um, News Night Scotland? No, I just, I just did the big audience six o'clock to seven o'clock thing right. on both sides. Okay. So two hours of, of broadcasting every night for a year, um, which is quite a lot of work to do that, but I was only transcribing that which was relevant. So almost 800 odd hours of... Uh, it, was, it turned out it was, it, was near, it was near 600 and something. I thought it was about 700 originally. But when the BBC complained, one of the things they found that I'd done wrong was I'd miscounted how many hours it was altogether. Right. As if, and, then, and then said, aha, you know, we've caught them, it must all be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> So I'd miscounted one the stitch in a garment, and they claim it's the fault. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. There are other versions of that as well. Um, so, but I, I didn't think that was tremendously interesting in a way. I, I I thought far more interesting was more detailed forms of bias. The one that you've probably heard a lot about in recent times is the demonising, the demonising of Alex Salmond, the tendency to conflate all of the ES campaign. A million people signed up, thousands of people active, with just the wishes of the first minister and to constantly say, Salmon wants this, Salmon wants that, or to say, Salmon disappointed by this, or sometimes Salmon embarrassed by that. This was up, this was up, when did the research end? Was it, was it? That first phase end, actually ended uh, more than a year ago. Right, it so it ended more than a year ago, and you identified the demonisation then? Then, yes. So the associations were being built up, that this is all about Alex, so. this is the Yes campaign, is Alex, Alex is a Yes yeah. campaign, Alex is what? What were the demonisation triggers? Well, I think what it does is it, is that it plays on the, the possibilities that some people may not like personally a politician. Uh-huh. And that has been done in, in previous generations with, with Labour leaders, for example, like Michael Foote, the tendency to conflate Labour policy with a, a doddering gentleman in, in a donkey jacket. Or an intellectual is another way you describe it. Well, yes, but, they, and that, but that's true, but they often describe them as an intellectual and therefore not suitable. Your intellectuals are no use at decision making and so on. What is different. the opposite of an intellectual then? I don't, I don't know. The opposite of an intellectual? I don't think there is an opposite. I've, yeah. I've, I've probably suggested there is there. I would, I would um, suggest that Alex is intellectually able as Patrick Harvey, as yes. Colin Fox, as Nicholas Sturgeon, yeah. all are intellectually able. I agree. Okay. I agree entirely with that. And if I've gone down the wrong path there, I withdraw. No, no, no. You, the, you've the gone down I mean, no, The point no. I was making though was that uh, uh, Michael Foote was characterised as the wrong kind of intellectual. Yes. The kind of, maybe who's too intellectual and not world, worldly enough. Right. Whereas right. no one would deny Alex Salmon's worldliness and Absolutely. his political savvy uh-huh. and so on. I think the suggestion was that Michael Foote wasn't of that kind. Um, that, that, particular, that particular tendency is, is, has been rehearsed throughout Europe, throughout history. Yeah. The tendency to say these ideas, these ideas may be quite difficult to attack. Let's a- attack the physical representation of the ideas. And, and I think that was done even more so. Uh, on, the, on the 11th of uh, 11th of September, the day the three leaders came up to, the, to Scotland, Alex, the reporting Scotland and BBC that night reported on the visit of the three and also Alex Salmon's speech. This was the speech at uh, which Nick, Nick, Nick... Nick Robinson. Nick Robinson. Nick political Robinson. editor of the BBC heckled. And lied. And distorted. Yeah. Now, my, there was much attention to that. My, my colleagues and my friends on Facebook were all furious about, about Nick Robinson and the big protest at Pacific Key, there was a big Nick Robinson banner. Yep. I didn't think that was the main story. I thought the main story was 14 times they referred to the Yes campaign as just Alex Salmond. They didn't once refer to the Yes campaign as a collective. Can I just establish the first phase? So there's a second phase and that's ongoing, is it? I've abandoned it. You've abandoned it? I abandoned it because in, in March, in March I was commissioned to do in April an in-depth study of Good Morning Scotland, 
right. Usenet Scotland did a crowd a crowdsource for that, and I did a very deep study there, which I think also highlighted a kind of instinctive bias in the coverage of Good Morning Scotland. It didn't get much attention because it didn't have this big ratio thing, which are the, you know, the media like this big bias ratio. Um, and then, then after that, I started to actually, I, I came out of the closet, as they say, with regard to the Yes campaign. I'd always been sympathetic, mm -hmm. but I'd done my best to be an impartial researcher. And I started in, in, in May, I started campaigning with the local Yes campaign in here. Right, so you were, you, uh, is there any other research going on of, of a similar kind? I did a couple of one-offs. I, di I did the 11th I mentioned, 11th of, of September, where I found a very strong bias. It was one of the most extreme. People in the Yes campaign I know were, were basically saying they were tempted to throw their televisions out the window that night, but mainly because of Nick Robinson, and I think a lot of them missed the fact that the whole show yeah. that night was... That was just the most egregious example. Yeah, it was a two-to-one ratio in terms of if you wanted a ratio. It was a two to one ratio. And I also did a study, a, a quick study of the night of the Glasgow riots and compared that with the, the egg throwing um, and the, the, the differential coverage that the BBC gave uh, Jim Murphy a huge amount of sympathetic coverage over the throwing of eggs. Then when it came to what was clearly a coordinated attack um, on yes campaigners in, in George Square, they treated that very lightly and held back. Their use of images was fascinating. Um, because, of course, on, on Twitter and on the internet generally, within seconds we saw the images of Better Together posters, mm -hmm. people with Better Together badges doing this. Large numbers of them. It was very clearly a, a fascistic, maybe associated with a particular ranger supporting group, the Something Bears, I can't remember the name, the Orange Lodge maybe, overlapping membership. Yep. It was a coordinated attack on, on men, women and children by biggish men. And, and the presentation on BBC was shamelessly um, impartial. So you're absolutely clear the BBC have been biased in their coverage, anecdotally, thematically, and in terms of the numbers of names used and how they've portrayed the First Minister. Yes. Their content, their behaviour is utterly biased. Can, really can, can I, just, I just want to address the camera for this, if I may. So let's be clear. Professor John Robertson is saying the BBC has been biased, in terms of how they've demonised the First Minister, Alex Salmon, who I think has done tremendously well to absorb that and come back from it. In terms of the number of, of uh, uses of uh, yes and no, in terms of how they've portrayed incidents like the um, George Square riots and the egg-throwing incidents, as if there's any degree of equivalence. So unequivocally, unequivocally, Professor John Robertson is saying the BBC is biased. So let's just be clear on that, OK? Um, you know. Question now, John, is is that significant in terms of the vote, do you think? Ah, media effects, yes. I, I've been asked about this a lot of Technical times. Technical terms, media effects, sorry, yeah. I, and, well, no, but it, and it's something I teach about. It's complex, it's complex. There, there is a lot of evidence that audiences are quite resilient. In particular, working class audiences are quite resilient. It's often uh, educated groups like professionals are often quite susceptible to, to media effects because they think they might be able to use this new information in their jobs so that teachers and social workers, for example, worry commonly about children watching mediated violence, mediated sexuality. The actual evidence is, is that there isn't much effect, that even children are quite resilient to these messages. With regard to voting, there's virtually no hard evidence of the direct effect of political campaigning or broadcasting and media coverage on voting behaviour. Right. Voters seem to be responding to something deeper and longer. Their, their, their family connections, their education at school and university, their, their, the views of their peer group. These seem to be very, very powerful, with one exception. And I think this is, this is crucial for the, the particular context we're, talk, we're talking about. And that's the, there is hard evidence that negative news about the economy, repeated over and over, does seem to have an effect. On, on voter attitudes and on voter behaviour. It leads to conservatism, in, with a small c, mm -hmm. leads to conservatism in voting if you constantly bombard an audience with bad news about the economy, about your pensions, about taxation, and so on. People are likely to vote status quo when that's the case. So I think we can see, looking at the Scottish situation here, that, that much of the, the scare stories, as they were called, much of the negative news will have scared a proportion of the yes voters. And I think someone did identify that 25% of the, the of the no vote, I should say, that should be no voters, 
25% of the no vote, I don't know how big the sample was, um, said they had been swayed by the promise of extra powers. And another 25% had been frightened by the threats to pensions and so on. So can we make a statement then that the BBC has directly skewed the result of the independence referendum? I think they've made a contribution. Right. I would argue that, that I would argue, however, that that, uh, that history teachers over the last hundred years or so have probably had a bigger impact on the population by teaching the positives of the British Empire and the strengths of Britishness and so on. I, I must think have that's went deeper. to a bad school because I never really got taught that. There was aspects of it. But you're younger than I am. This, this is true. John is a, a, just a little fraction older than me. No. I think I think that there has been a significant improvement in the in the history education and modern studies, and so on, and even geography education in Scottish schools school since about the maybe the seventies and eighties with the introduction of introduction of, of new, not quite um, universal curricula, but with some kind of structure guided from a centre, where there's been a push away from. It. For example, I I was taught only British imperial history right. in secondary school, and I can remember taking. Te- talking to my history teachers about it, they had gone to Glasgow University in the 1950s and 60s and there had been no Scottish history courses. None at all. So in part there's a legacy issue. So they, 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 I mean, they didn't even know about modern Scottish history because they hadn't been taught it. They may have learned a lot themselves. So are we saying, are we saying and this is part of your background in terms of educational technology as yeah. a, a study area, but in terms of um, the BBC history teachers, it is multidimensional. I had the pleasure of speaking to yeah. Blair Jenkins yesterday and he suggested that the last two weeks of Project Fear um, brought home the result for, um, for the No campaign. And he also hinted at the, the demonisation of Alex Salmon. Can we just stay with the demonisation of, of Alex? We, I'm a great fan of, okay, so I'll lay my cards on the table. Oh. Can I actually just say I'm, I'm not an SNP member sure. and uh, my politics are a bit to the left of the SNP. Fair enough, yeah. If I joined a party it would be the Greens probably or... Um, because I'm utterly opposed to NATO and to the monarchy and so on. So now That's a come on to Patrick Harvey and Sarah, Sarah Beatty yeah, Smith, well, etc. Big fan of Patrick Harvey. So there you go, yeah, he's a, a big fan of Patrick big. Harvey as well, so there we are. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting. Right. So get, your, get yourselves organised, guys, and call the guy. So let's just come back to the demonisation of Alex Salmond and the association, heaped upon association. What, what were the key words, do you think, around Alex Salmond? Untrust, untrustworthy. Untrustworthy. Yeah. yeah, I think that's. I think in some ways that's the really the dominant one. I my I I've spoken to people, uh, you know, in the street as they say, because I've been out campaigning for the Yes campaign in Ayrshire, and and they would often use the word sleek it, sleek it. They would characterise as Alex Salmond as sleek it. Now he has a smile. He does. I don't. I don't think of him as sleek it at all. I'm, I'm he not. also has a shadow. <laughs> <laughs> he has a smile and a shadow. Yeah, or even his chin. Yes, it's the, the, the Richard Nixon. Problem, you could argue, I suppose, that as Richard Nixon was being was being this is the radio with John F. Kennedy. I uh, was John F. Kennedy. People, uh, people on radio thought Nixon had won. People on watching television thought JFK had won, uh-huh. and, and they, they reckoned it was because over the period of the interview, uh, N- Nixon developed a big shadow on his chin. He just grew that quickly, you know. And he sweated a great deal. And as sweated, well. yeah. yeah. I think it's more to do with I. I think it's Alex. Alex is as a is a sharp sense of humour, and he's the only. A senior politician who can really hold it on have a good news for, for example, he can really hold his own. And I think people like me, I think that's Roy Harsley did quite well. On he it. did, when, right. you know, when he went on as a, a that's true. A tub of lard, he did quite well. <laughs> yes, that, that was quite good. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, I think, I think Salmond is is very appealing to a lot of Scottish guys because he can hold his own. What he's and, got banter. Yeah, and he can he stands up for himself, and you think, and a lot of Scottish guys think I'm with that. I think I think some Scottish guys like like in particular like Alistair Darling, sort of genteel, privately educated lads, look at him with a little distaste. Thirty five thousand pounds a year it costs to go to Loreto. Ah. Well did you notice in the debate that, that, that Alistair Darling didn't look at Salmon at all in the debate? He always looked past them. And someone has suggested that uh, some researchers suggest that's to do with class. It's to do with a feeling of superiority. That if someone is being very direct and working class, you don't look at them. You look away from them, and uh, I'm wondering, weren't we? We're getting a bit tangential. No, but I'm I'm just conscious. I'm looking at you. 
Right. <laughs> I'm not looking past you. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm wearing my roots here. I'm just looking right Actually, at you. Well, we're, we're both clan members. Of Absolutely. We can't, uh, we, what he means by that, we're both Robertsons in case that goes anywhere badly. Right. Unconnected to George in any way. Uh, well, we, we would disclaim him rapidly. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's just switch back. Right, so, bring me back to the topic. So the untrustworthy aspect. Now, I met the guy, I trust him. I, I, I support yeah. him. And I support, you know, what you're seeing in terms of holding his own and having yeah. a sharp sense of humour. Jeez, if we're all to be punished for that, it'd be a fairly bleak, very really bleak world. So, you know, when the press are picking up that story, the 36 out of the 37 broad, uh, media, the papers and the broadcasts are doing similarly, how can you, how can you possibly fight back against that? Well, I th- well, we're in the midst of it right now, aren't we, in this in this studio? And in, in what uh, I think is, you know, people use the term how exciting things are. People in education use it a lot, and they often use the word exciting for things where everybody else is looking at the ceiling and, you know, in despair. But what's happening in the Scottish media right now is genuinely exciting. I think it's probably revolutionary. And and where we are just now in, in this tiny emerging, um, what are we, a company? Is it a company? I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's, it's an organisation. And what's happening with, with, you know, with Newsnet Scotland and Derek Bateman. And there, 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 there looks like here, I think, a revolution in politics and media. The massive green, uh, green grassroots, sorry, green grassroots, if you like, the massive grassroots yes campaign, absolutely enormous, about a million people, virtually a million people active, and the growth of new media outlets, using the internet and using Facebook and so on, I think is, you know, for a media professor, is I, I feel I should be writing papers right now, it's just... I, I, we're in the midst of something really dramatic. I think you're right. I mean, and it's very positive. Absolutely, because it presents a different perspective on reality. And as phenomenologists, we, we celebrate that, right? That's right, because the media can structure many... reality for us. Exactly, if we allow them to. Yeah, yeah it's hard to resist sometimes. Yeah. See more? Well, I, I think that... Um, I think, but if, you, if you think, for example, of what's happening in, in Iraq right now, um, uh, the perceptions of a lot of the population... Who have no obviously no direct connection with Iraq, are largely embracing the images of Iraq and of, of ISIS or ISIL or whoever they are. ISIS, from, ISIL, and IS. I think it's the three ones. I ISIL. Uh, yeah, our our information services people on the the air campus use <laughs> IS, and we've <laughs> we've had a word with them about new students maybe not understanding quite what that would be. Um, but I, I think what w- what we have is a very clear picture, and I, I see it in talking to my my youngest child who's. In debate with her, she, she's doing history at school, and um, and in debate with her friends uh-huh. over what's actually happening there. You know, who are these people, and how do we know they're like the the, the way we, we we appear to think they are, and that that's entirely mediated. We have no other source unless we knew someone from Iraq. We'd have no other picture, and so I think reality construction for for most of the population most of the time is mediated. Hmm. Even though they themselves will say, "Oh, I don't believe everything I hear," it's it's insidious. But the opposite of that is um, philosophical solipsism. So you know, what can you do about it? What can you do about it? Well, I suppose you can read widely and, and listen widely, uh-huh. and I think that's there. So diversity, genuine diversity in the media, is it's what we we, we would pray for. We're hoping um, to move towards that, as you yeah. say, we're part of that process. And yeah. despite what John McClelland, uh, you know, former uh, Scotsman editor said on 2014 that there is virtually no diversity in the, the mainstream Scottish media. There's hardly any diversity at all. And, uh, and I, I was quite disappointed by, um, by Richard Walker of the... Um, is it Richard Walker of the, the, the Herald? Who said that there isn't enough diversity in the Scottish media, and I don't know why. And uh, I thought... I, I, I had a wee exchange with him about this, and he doesn't agree with my view. I, th- I think there's a very clear reason. The, the BBC know the reason. That's because the BBC commonly appoint people from private school backgrounds in huge numbers. The BBC did their own study. 54% of the top 100 journalists in a BBC study in 2007, 54% were privately educated. Only I, of, 7% of the population were privately educated. In Edinburgh, that's 25%, incidentally, <laughs> which why why the result is skewed towards no in Edinburgh, I would suggest. In yes, the main. Uh, there is a campaign in Glasgow, of course, to have the, have the capital moved. To where it, you know, to Dundee or Glasgow, I guess. The Thames fans would have to change a lot of their songs. They couldn't sing yeah. from the capital. Do you think Leith voted yes? Uh, I think Leith is Edinburgh North was a was forty thousand for no, and about twenty eight thousand for yes. So it's a twelve thousand differential. Right, so, so so clearly, big chunks of the north of Edinburgh voted uh, no. Is this is the, uh, 
this is the, the what's the term for when you the bourgeoisification of Leith, I suppose. Yes, well, there's there's people with very strong opinions on that. Irvin Welsh and Kevin <laughs> Williamson amongst yeah. others. Irvin Welsh re- retweeted my research, uh, but to his five hundred thousand followers now, I was quite pleased at the time. But it was it was after Frankie Boyle had retweeted my research to one point six three million. And uh, but of those, only only eighty thousand watched my video, and I thought eighty thousand out of one point six three million. Maybe this is a Calvinist way of thinking about things. I thought that's not that great, actually, is it? Eighty thousand out of one point six three million. I'm both to, to say anything about either of them. I admire them both greatly. And Irvin was supposed to appear on a results show, was he? Uh-huh. But, but it wasn't able to make it because he was erstwhile delayed. I think September would use Irvin, wouldn't it? Um, let's come back to to um, the the nature of what can be done. We're mm-hmm. talking about broadcasting, um, the, the social media changes, you know, Congo yeah. want to do things, National Collective want to do things, Bella Caledonia are doing things, obviously we are doing things here at Broadcasting Scotland, have a lot of plans for the future too. Yeah. Where does it leave you, in your personal experience, there you are, working on really creative stuff around um, research around Asperger's, oh, and how it's portrayed in the media, um, high digger and that those associations, and all of a sudden, from you know, you know, not so much a, a huge public profile. No, no, no. Not no public profile, other <laughs> than just being a, a good citizen, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, um, you've got the BBC. I would say bullying you. How, how how was that for you? How was that experience? Well, it was unnerving, as I, I said. It was unnerving. I can't remember now whether we discussed this before the interview proper or well, whether we discussed it in the interview proper. It was seamless quality. <laughs> it was. So it was unnerving at the time until my principal... Uh, it gave you a Yes, we did start I, that in the We interview. did, yes. So I, I, academic freedom was, was guaranteed. And I felt pretty good about it. I'm also a, a senior academic in a sense that I'm not thinking about my future career. I'm not thinking, hey, it would be good to transfer and become a senior member of staff at the BBC. You know, that's, <laughs> that's not going to happen, but I don't care. Uh-huh. Whereas a younger, a younger so member of staff... So you've got less to lose, so you can speak, out, you can speak freely because you've got less to lose. Yeah. I suppose, you know, oppressive organisations fear that. They fear that people have freedom to speak because they're not frightened of the consequences. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I don't want to come across as a hero here because I occasionally get that kind of email, and uh-huh. I'm not. I'm just kind of going with the flow here a bit. Okay, so yeah. you're, well, you say you're not a hero. Well, how would you describe yourself then? Oh, what I should have said, yeah. The way I describe myself is actually, I think the hero here is, is Noam Chomsky. No, no, Noam Chomsky has been, uh, I don't have heroes much. Bob Dylan warned me about that way back. But Noam Chomsky and Edward Said, I don't know if you know of Edward yes, Said. Yes, I've at all. read yeah, the Age of the age Orientalism. Of the uh, he, he wrote something about empires as well, about the heart yeah. of darkness, because he did the Reef Lecture. Um, a Palestinian a Christian lecture, professor of linguistics, at, no, not literature, at New York, literature. dead now. Yeah. Um, Edward Said's v- uh, views helped me understand the mediation of the Islamic world, understand it properly, because he could see it in a way that I don't think I could before. No- Noam Chomsky is, to my mind, the, the greatest public intellectual. And all of my ideas, I have to largely, well, not, maybe not every detail, but much of what I say and think was was uh, is a, is a consequence of reading Noam Chomsky, so I, I see myself, you know, I, I certainly I, I see myself an acolyte, perhaps. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to push. I'm trying to push his his insight into the, the relationship between media and power, right. and and trying to apply it to a Scottish context, which hasn't been done too much. Okay, so one of the one of the Chomsky quotes that was put in a graphic for distribution was, you know, if you how about managing consent, where you you talk about the parameters of debate, but within those parameters you can argue fiercely. Mm. So the parameters are set narrowly. And I suppose, interestingly, for, for, in terms of my background, this is the first time that the British state has been brought into question in such a powerful way. Mm. And to a certain extent, I was expecting the onslaught from the press, the broadcasters and the institutions of the British sure. state, but it still took my breath away, quite, quite some of the stuff they were doing. Uh-huh. So in that respect, in terms of Chomsky, do you believe that's been the case, that the, the, the debate has been narrowed, but it's been fierce within the narrow debate? Yes, yes. I mean, Chomsky himself was, was slow to actually um, approve of the, uh, of the campaign for independence because I think he, he has a, a twitch with regard to nationalism. Sure. And that nationalism is an interesting topic we, we talk about all day. 
I, I, I had three I had three emails with, with Chomsky, so which are there's an open goal that I'll be scoring in shortly. I, I, feel, I feel hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So let's just with regards to the three emails, I, I, no, no, I was no, almost no, tempted. Hold on a second. Oh, sorry. You've had three mail three emails from Noam Chomsky as a guy sitting on the couch next to me who I'm talking to lie. You've been speaking to Noam Chomsky. Not not just by email after oh, by email, whatever. By email. <laughs> the emails. <laughs> I Awesome. Um, yeah, well, it is, but I did think about printing them out and, and getting them framed and putting them on the wall, and I thought that would be pretty sort of naff and childish. So I haven't. He, he, he and I had a, an Go exchange on. about this because he was he was uncomfortable about the association of nationalism. And I think, that, you know, the SNP years ago should have changed their name because I, I don't think they are, in, in that sense, a nationalist party anymore. That's my partner's view, actually. That, that's interesting. She, yeah. she's, she's from England. And her but I, persuade, I, I persuaded him that this was a, an anti-establishment, anti-imperial movement, a bit like Catalan uh, nationalism and Basque nationalism, but not like Serbian or Croatian nationalism, right. which is much more ethnic. Yeah. Um, and, and he came round and, and on Russia Today, he, he did actually say that he approved of, of the, the Scottish independence movement. Was that that detailed interview you did? Yeah, quite a long one. Yeah. With Max Kaiser, I think. Yes. And, and, uh, and of course, huffily, I, I noted he didn't mention me. Taught him everything he knows about Scottish independence, but he didn't, didn't mention it. These things all. happen. It's, it's too big, obviously. Yeah. But we'll, we'll note that now. Mr Chomsky, I think you need to give due regard to John Robertson. <laughs> he, won't, he won't be watching this. <laughs> he <laughs> gets so be, much. He might be his LinkedIn. How, did you, how was that initiated? Did you I sent, I sent him a copy of my research. Right. And he wrote back, said he was really interested in it, because he, he, he's obviously interested in the propaganda model in different contexts. Right, the propaganda model. We are coming back to the idea of nationalism as well, because that's yeah. just too juicy a subject to ignore. Okay. Let's go with the propaganda model. What do you mean? The propaganda model is, <coughs> is Chomsky and, and Ed Herman, to be fair. Ed Herman and Noam Chomsky wrote Manufacturing Consent, 1989, I think, in which they, they argued that um, Western media are propagandised. And most people already know that Soviet media were propagandised, Nazi media were propagandised. The population knew. I mean, if you lived in the Soviet Union and you got a message coming at you from the media, you knew it was a big fib, despite the name Pravda, meaning truth. So the, the population were, in, in a sense, inured to propaganda because they knew everything was propaganda. The great success of Western democracies, uh, capitalist democracies, is that the people have been persuaded that they're not being propagandised, that there is a free media. Now, that's partly because there is a degree of free media. Uh -huh. And there are individuals, I mean, there's, there's, there are people at Sunday Herald, of course, Bell and... and uh, Ian McWhorter as well. McWhorter, Bell and McWhorter, for example. They, they are clearly off the lead in a sense. They are, because they are so good, yeah. and because the audience likes them so much, mm -hmm. they are allowed. Uh, Bell writes in ways that are, are full-blown anarchism, communism, you might argue some of his ideas, and he gets away with it. But a Marxist interpreter of that would say this is this is repressive tolerance. Capitalism is successful because it doesn't clamp down everything. Yeah. It allows a certain amount of dissent because that dissent then keeps middle class people like me, professors and, and, and journalists and so on, keeps us happy that there is something for us. The truth is being spoken. But it's being spoken typically late at night on Channel 4 or it's being spoken in small outlet you know, in newspapers. Um, so... Propaganda still applies for Chomsky in, in, in the Western democracies. It's just far more subtle and therefore more effective. You mention, you mention Russia, you, you slip in Pravda and its meaning of the truth. You mention Germany, Nazi Germany. And it, what it ties into is Edward Bernays. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Edward Bernays. That's Freud's nephew. No, no. Freud's nephew took a lot of his papers and became the first main PR guy in... Uh, oh, yes, I have. In yes, the US. Right, so, so he did a lot of the early PR work. Yeah. Quite a shady character in terms yeah. of some of his, his dealings and stuff. Yeah. But Goebbels read a lot of Bernie's, yes. Bernie's work and one of his early pamphlets was propaganda. Is that in, in Adam Curtis's Power of Nightmares documentary? You know, it's, it's where I picked up was in... Um, God, it's, it's a three-series... Program. Right. It'll come back to me during the course of the. And it wasn't Adam Curtis. No. It might have been Adam Curtis. That, that, yeah. uh, yes, it was in our in our time. The trap. Um, no, I have to no. come back to it. Never mind. But he's he's interviewed heavily. It's about the managing of consent. Yes. Party. Let's come back to Chomsky. What was his response ultimately when you he was interested in the findings and then what? Yeah. He said he wanted to think about it. I right. Thought, you know, true academic. Um, I mean, he's he's a man well in his seventies. 
and he, he's inundated, of course, because he is, in some ways, he's the hero figure of the alternative media. Uh-huh. Um, and it's, but he, he came back and he asked me a couple of questions about it, about about the SNP in particular, uh-huh. and about their agenda and their, you know, their their, uh, their, their And I, I pointed out that although I wasn't an SNP supporter directly, that many other policies were to the left of the the Labour Party, in particular on welfare and so on. And uh, and I pointed out, and I took, I said to him, isn't this isn't this an example of the the collapse of empires? That the, the, the British Empire has shrunk from its massive uh, spread across the planet and that its final collapse is the breaking away of Wales, Ireland and, 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 and Scotland. And that that will be a good thing for the English. Yes. It's not, it's not a sort of sense of leaving something horrible. It's a sense of maybe triggering change there as well. And a reconfiguration, a reconstruction yeah. of how we see ourselves on these islands, That's which right. is how I prefer to And an be. enhancement of democracy, just yeah. more democracy. Absolutely. The collapse of empires, let's flip back to Edward Said. I never knew that we were going to be discussing Edward Syed today. No. Uh, um, but that's, that takes me back to the early early 90s, actually, no. when he produced that book. Um, he, he focused a lot on the on the, the novel, The Age of not the Darkness, or something, uh, I forget the book. Uh, um, I've, not, I've not read a novel, I've only read uh, Orientalism. Right. And there's also his book about the media. Right. And, and how, how, how we all, even Western liberals and, and intellectuals, he says, suffer from Orientalism. Uh-huh. He means by that, because of our, largely because of our upbringing and our experience of, uh, of fiction, in particular in film, we cannot see, in particular, the Arab, we cannot see the Arab the way the Arab feels he should be seen by us. That's interesting because, in terms of my background, I, I, I'm a great fan of uh, Khalil Gibran oh, yes. and uh, Rumi. Right. And that feeds into what that I, I do. don't know that stuff, but, but I know but, of it. But, but, it, but it's Oriental in the yeah. sense that, well, it's Arabic in the sense that uh, Khalil Gibran was yes. um, from Lebanon. Right. And that informs a lot of humanist ceremonies now. Uh, Does it? Oh, yeah, in, ter- in terms of some of the poetry. Uh-huh. I've been yeah. at humanist funerals, and uh, the, 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 the constant factor for me was Tamla Motown. Uh, the Tamil Motown songs appeared at both of these humanist <laughs> funerals. What were the songs you can't this, this old heart of mine in particular, <laughs> by the Eisen Brothers, which had everyone in tears, everyone in tears. I'm actually incredible. Well, my dad had Mario Land's I Walk With God, which is great. <laughs> 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 which was just a statement of the arrogance. But yeah. we, we digress. Go, going back to so the idea that we shifted to Edward Said and we looked at the idea of Chomsky being compromised by just the very trigger word of nationalism. Yes. Is that a re- should the SNP then consider changing their name? I thought for a long time that they should. I mean, I'd, maybe the acronym wouldn't sound so good, but you know, Scottish Independence Party, something like that. I don't know what's wrong with Sips. I don't know what's wrong with Sips. 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 quite good. It's okay. Uh, autonomy Party wouldn't be so good. That'd be SAP. Right, uh, okay. That's not, not so good. Okay, yeah. but you certainly. Well, I think it's, I can see why they haven't because, because they're, they're too far along the line. And it's an established it. brand. Yeah, I mean, it would, you'd be daft to, to choose a new name now. But uh-huh. but it, I think it does cause anxiety, and I think a lot of people in the... I, I joined the, 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 the Air Town uh, Yes campaign. Right. But 50 people turned up to the, the market inn in, in Air, which is a lovely horseshoe bar, and we were upstairs. Now, 40 or 50 people, less than 10 were SNP members. Less than 10. Right. Several labour for a Yes, but a majority had never been involved in politics before. And or some some greens as well. I should have as I should mention the greens. Uh, some greens there as well, and some from the radical independence campaign, and and working in a very collegial way. It was a fantastic atmosphere. That's what's come across. I mean, as I say, Blair Jenkins was on yesterday, and I also had Colin Fox on. I'm desperately trying to get a green on. It's not happened yet, but very welcome anybody from the Green Party. Right. But the the collegiate nature of things was the the key component, and yeah. the. Uh, Players suggested initially because the SNP had been used to being in power and used to doing things a certain way, there was an initial adjustment period for them to move to a flatter organisation structure, yeah. but they very re- rapidly did so, and I think they massively enjoyed it as well, the collegiate right. nature of it. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a good idea, that the, mm. the, the SNP should consider the name change. If they've got 70,000 members now, if it's a more sort of, if it's, if it's less tied to that emotive work. Yeah, this is maybe a time they could do it. I can see why they wouldn't have done it in the past. This yeah. may be an opportunity to... To consider that. That's yeah. a free idea for you guys. There you go, man. Straight from Profe- Professori John Robertson there. <laughs> uh, okay, let's, let's, let's come on to other areas um, in terms of how you've perceived the yes side of the campaign. What struck you about it? I thought it was joyous. I thought it was astonishingly joyous and full of good humour. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I just, I just, I was stunned by it. None, none of the kind of, I'd, I'd been at, at university, I'd been involved in left of centre sort of political groups, you know, and, and it was just all <coughs> infighting. It was all bickering over what the people's so Judea, Judea. Yes, that kind of money buying from them, which was it was very very opposite. Um, and the, my experience was was of of. I keep using the word collegiality, but that's that's the kind of word that it gets you a high it, it, gets you a high Scrabble score. It's a very it's a very good <laughs> word for it. <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, was that people were people were leading, but different people were leading at different times. So people would suggest things, others would try and help them with ideas, and occasionally, if they disagreed with them, they, they wouldn't put them down. They would, they would, they would say something humorous. Yes. And, it's, and humor was used to keep people in their place a wee bit, but equally, there was, it was very supportive. And when I was out actually campaigning door to door, in, uh, for example, in the town of Mabel, to the south of there, uh, walking around the streets there, never an angry word from anybody. In the, from anybody in the town, tremendously good atmosphere. But the team I was in, it divided up in a kind of cellular way, and people suggested things, but there was no leader. There was no, there was no one you could have said afterwards. They led that. Can I? Can I just? This is this is this is directly for Kevin Pringle, um, director of communications at the SNP. I invited him out a long, long time ago, in early ninety one or ninety two. I'm old. To. Um, when I was a political education officer of the Juniper Babberton branch of the SNP, really, which yeah. it was for six months, uh-huh. and it was at that stage that I, I came across the term from Kevin of anarcho syndicalism. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I've read a, ro- a lot around it in terms uh-huh. of Paul Goodman and various other people uh-huh. in the field historically, and um, it seems to me that this is that what you're talking about, and, and Blair is talking about this like, key central structure, the framework. Yeah. Then there's a spontaneous emergence where leaders emerge and they're situational leaders and not leaders because yes. I'm the leader forever. They emerge in that leadership role as and when required and yeah. the group reconstitutes yeah. to, to then support a new, a new person, a new convener. Even, yeah. even Women for Indy or Business for Scotland, yeah. you know, Gordon McIntyre Kemp was initially quite um, to the fore in that and then Ivor McKee and then Ian Blackford and various others came to the fore. So it wasn't people trying to hog the position. Yes. And it, and it was, just to talk about the anarcho-syndicalism, apart from everything else, it's, it's great to see it. Go and have a wee go. It was interesting that the, the, the Scottish anarchists, actually, are, are, there are several Scottish anarchist groups, all utterly opposed to independence. Uh-huh. Every single one of them. I found that quite surprising in some ways that they were. Um, I, there, is, there is another way. Um, I, I, years and years ago, when I was involved in the, the training of head teachers in schools, um, one of the, the set texts was Tom Peters, the, the management guru. Yes. And I, I remember only one phrase from it because it was a pretty dreary book. But I remember one phrase, and it was a bit like this. And he, he said that good organisations have simultaneous loose, tight qualities. Oh, In other that. words, they, 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 they talk and exchange ideas. Then when they get an idea that they think will work, Comes in. they pull tight and they go yeah. forward. Yeah. And then they reach a new challenge, and they loosen up, they talk, and so on, and then they tighten up. And, and I think that's kind of like... The, but you see, it worked with the Yes campaign because of the very clear focus and the, the strongly shared ambition. It was almost like a religious movement. Almost. And I Ian wonder... Ian hinted at that, that the sort of happy, clappy, hippie aspect of it. Yeah, I'd agree with that, yes. And there were quite, quite elderly people at times, quite a lot of the, you know, of the baby boomers there. I was walking around the hills of Mabel in a group of four and uh, I, I, have, I, have, I had had an operation on my toe just a few days before it, so I was limping. There was another guy who had done an operation on both his knees, and he was limping around, and we're, so we're, we're trudging around this, the, the hills of Mabel, wondering, where are the young heroes of the Yes campaign? <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as silver beards trudge up and down hills and so. But there's, there's heroes across all categories. I had one of the heroes on, which was Jim Sillers. Oh, yes. We had travelled around <laughs> everywhere, it seems. Yeah. And I said, I, I'd said to him, how many speeches had you given, Jim? And I know, I know you've had 46... Interviews. interviews, and I think what Jim had. That's with a job. Say again? <laughs> That's with a job. That's with a job. Yeah, and I think Jim had. Um, I mean, he was powered. I think by a lot of feeling for for his wife. Of course. Um, we 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 were still very much part of the campaign as far as I could see. Yeah. Um, but he was doing on occasions off you from the back of the van, the Margot wheel, twelve talks a day. <laughs> so we'd pull up at a bar. He'd get the microphone or, or the megaphone and he would start to speak maybe for about 10, yeah. 10 minutes or so. 
So the, but he's, he, 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 I mean, he's a genuine heroic figure of the, uh, of oh, the campaign, he, I would say. We could, we can come, but there was heroes across the board. Um, you know, Zara Gladman would did, uh, did, did the song. Yeah. You know, there, there was people. National Collective were collectively heroic yes. as well in terms of the yes, yes, the vote. Um, how do you think they've been portrayed in the mainstream media? These these characters, these emergent heroes. I think that I think the main thing the mainstream media have done is to ignore actually, right, and to you know and not characterise the these are some of the the very positive aspects of the yes campaign. In a in an attempt, in an attempt, they will claim to be balanced. They you know you, you couldn't say something about yes without saying something about no, and you and so so that. When, the, when there would be, you know, thousands of people in the street with the S banners up and down Buchanan Street or out at Pacific Key and so on, they would show a few seconds of that and then try and find a way of showing better together, equally vibrant. And yeah. to do so requires some very clever camera jiggery. Popping, and a lot of electricity you know, as well. To, to try and find, you know, enough. I mean, there are some examples on, on Twitter, of course, of, uh, of Ruth Davidson speaking to what looks like a crowd. You take the camera around the side and you see it's a very thin crowd. Uh-huh. Where, and that would be characterised as somehow equivalent to the Yes campaign. Like phantom but divisions. that's fair, of course, isn't it, they would argue. That's fair to show the Yes and the No campaigns as equally well supported. Just, just in terms of that, you know, this is part of the fight back against the bias. Um, but, but going forward, is their position sustainable? The No campaign? The BT, the, the, the Better Together groupings, but mainly the broadcasters and the media... Is their position sustainable when you've got 1.6 million of the population, 45% of all those that voted pro-yes? Mm. Is it sustainable to have 36 out of 37 papers pro-no? Is it sustainable to have the position in, in the mainstream broadcasters? Well, with regard to the newspapers, I, I think, you know, the, the marketplace itself, you know, we, we, I think Adam Smith comes uh, comes into this one. That I, I think Welcome, Adam. Nice to have you on board. The, the, the newspapers are in trouble. Uh-huh. Newspapers are in, are in deep trouble. But I know the Scotsman claim an increase in, in readership because of their clear no support, and the and also the Sunday Herald had a fairly significant increase. percent. Yeah, so that and that's pretty healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, how long that will last, I don't know. There may be a honeymoon element to that, mm-hmm. but I, I think we're we're already well along a road towards the um, the rationalising of the newspaper market uh-huh. and and the, the the reduction in the number of of titles. Um, some of the newspapers, because of their intelligent linkage with the internet, like The Guardian, for example, will survive because they'll make money out of the internet. Though the, surprisingly, they lost a number of subscribers. Unsurprisingly, rather, they lost a number of subscribers. We were yes voters. Oh them, yes, yeah. Because they just they were sick of their eventually coming out for uh, no. Their editorial, yeah. yeah. That was The Guardian's quite an interesting one. I mean, I I, I stopped reading The Guardian in two thousand and three, or, or buying it in two thousand and three because of their support for the Iraq War, at that point. Um, and I, I, but there were some very good articles, as you know, in in the Guardian and George Bombio suggesting that to vote no was akin to self harm. I thought it was quite an interesting piece. So they allowed that a lot of that. But you're right, their editorial was was no. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that in some ways is unsustainable in Scotland. And I, I think the I think the newspapers will continue to struggle because of their approach. Um, the I, BBC, go on, yes, the, the BBC. I I I've already signed up. To the campaign to devolve the BBC. I, I think they absolutely must devolve the BBC. I, I think there'll be a huge struggle against that. Oh, absolutely. But I think they must devolve the BBC to Scottish government control. But when, when we talk about devolving to, I suppose it'd be a Scottish Broadcasting Corporation, we pay tithe to, to the, the centre. Yes. But when we do that, how, does the, how do things actually change then? Is, it, is there an editorial statement that says, look, you've got to be in far more balance and this means that? Well, I think the, the the Hollywood Education and Culture Committee would then be in a position of authority, right. rather than just being in a kind of I don't know what term you would use, a, 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 not even consultative because uh, heckling, yeah, maybe if, yeah, be, because the the BBC are not obliged to report to the Education and Culture Committee in the kind of detail that committee wants. They they won't see how many complaints they've had about this and that. And they won't have let that committee have any particular influence on decision making about production. I mean, as well as the devolution, there has to be a devolution of, of the budget, so that the amount raised in Scotland is is then reflected in the amount produced in Scotland. The amount spent. So it's about three hundred eighty-five million, isn't it, roughly? Yeah. And but, but obviously, a lot of people are not paying their licences as a protest against the bias. Yeah. 
Um, and whether we get to that situation where it is devolved or not would seem a, a, a fraught political area. Yes. Um, but in the meantime, what we can do is to do stuff like this and, and, and write appropriate papers and what have you. Yeah. In, term, in terms of your career, what, what's the smile for? <laughs> <laughs> I think of it as nearly ended, you see, All right. in some ways. Okay. Some ways. Your, your great work, your best works are behind you, and you can... Don't, sit... don't, just in the last six months, though. <laughs> <laughs> we never know where our time will be, though. No, we don't, you? yeah. It just is thrust upon it's us. It's when your things. employer says you're going places and then you realise it's the door. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're nowhere near no, that. No, no, I'm You're nowhere near that yet. Yeah. In terms of the individuals involved, shipping in James Nocte for, for, for Radio, Radio Scotland, mm. some of the individuals, you know, I, I don't want to demonise like the press and broadcasters no, no. have done with, the essay, with, with, with Alex Salmond. Mm. But, you know, what's their position in this now, these individuals? I, I don't know. I mean, I presumably they're welcome back uh, south of the border. I thought Sarah Smith probably escapes a lot of criticism, although the show was dire. Sarah Smith, people tend not to like criticising Sarah Smith. But, uh, but Nocte, I thought, was a huge damp squib in terms of... I mean, he interviewed, he interviewed George Robertson, in, went all the way to the US to interview George Robertson and didn't ask him a hard question once. Now, I don't know if it's because George was on that rant, which was borderline psychotic, that rant about you know, forces of darkness and so on, that I don't know whether James Nocte was thinking, oh, I better not ask him any questions. Like he's struck down with his, yeah. his lightsaber. That's sort of, yes. <laughs> yes, that would be it. <laughs> yes, Darth Vader. Yeah. Um, so I, I think and I think Nocte did a, a couple of kind of um, grumpy interviews with Nicholas Sturgeon and with, um, I think, I, I can't remember who, no, it was... It was it was with um, mm, Ewing. It was with Ewing, Ewing and and, uh, and and with uh, with Nicholas Sturgeon. Where he interrupted, he punched he punched hard with his phrases. He cut them off at the end and so on. I, I reported on this in a piece of research which is published, and and he was then by contrast much more gentle with with unionist. Like uh, I am with you. <laughs> Very gentle. I'm not yes. punchy going and say yes. why do you say that? Why do you say that that way? Why do you say it now? Yes, Which, as you as you're not being, yeah. Yeah. He's um he, he, there was a lot of that and I think Noct Nocty was a disappointment in that he was so gentle with George Robertson uh -huh. and then had a go at Nicholas Sturgeon. I think there there is an issue about about the having a go at Nicholas Sturgeon with male reporters generally, which is something for my, my feminist colleagues to maybe say more about. What um, you think that they I are think, unduly aggressive with Nicola? I, I think she I think she gets a harder time than a male equivalent would get. Can we be clear? Nicola, you will not get a hard time on here. You will thoroughly enjoy the process, I can assure you of that. Well and but luckily she's tremendously capable and handles it very well. Absolutely. But um, it's a lot to tolerate on a day to day basis. And I suppose that's one of the things for me in terms of Alex and, and Nicola and Patrick and Colin and all the other people involved in the movement. The constant like lack of space. I mean, it's, it's like going to battle every time you go yes. on telly or every time you go into a broadcast, right. and that's a wearing process through time. It is, it is, and yet not applied to to others. I mean, Haley Miller's uh, interview with the Weir Group was an astonishing piece of fawning, essentially, where no hard questions were asked. In fact, she prompted them to say negative things. This was a Weir, Weir Group who yeah, came yeah. out with research against independence. I don't think of them as weird pumps. I don't like. I think weird pumps is a better name for them. Um, this this was at a time when they'd just been fined several million pounds for working for uh, gun running and yeah. not gun running as such, but selling things to Saddam Hussein. Yeah, and and they're presented as somehow reliable uh, voices on independence. You, I, I, I don't like the ad hominem, but I think that in this circumstance, it's appropriate to, to, to comment. What I was struck by and what I was incensed by because I didn't catch everything was no. Healy Miller's interview with Alex Salmond. Yes. which again involved the, the lack of space, the badgering, yeah. um, not allowing, and I've said it several times, but it bears repeating, not allowing Alex to expound mm -hmm. the argument, expand the argument, to yes. take it in expository ways. Yeah. It, it, it was very frustrating to listen to. The, de the defence you get, I mean, and the defence I've had from people who support the BBC, is that they do that with everyone, and it's journalism. Uh -huh. And I say, but they didn't. They didn't do it with the Weir Group, didn't do it with George Robertson, they don't do it with, you know, various... Uh, the, the, the gentleman from, um, what's the business organisation? Uh, business for Scotland, the CBI? CBI, yes. We did the well, it, was a, it, it was a business organisation, but it yes. turns out it was an institutional organisation. Well, the, the interviewing of the CBI, CBI chief executive 
very passive, very respectful, no difficulties at all. And then a Business for Scotland representative, a business from, from Aberdeen, comes on and they're, as you say, badgered, closed yeah. off. Um, and, and so it's the inconsistency. Yeah. It's the complete contradiction of what they say that they're impartial. You see, you see that Alex, you see, so you see Nicholas seems to get a hard time from the broadcasters. Yes. And at the same token, you see that Sarah Smith seems to be been lit off lightly. What do you mean? Well, I, I mean, I don't know what it is, but there, there seems to have been a, a gentle touch with Sarah Smith, as if she's not responsible in somehow. I mean, she has a, a pleasant manner, and she doesn't tend to knit people off. And, you know, she, she has a, a gentle manner with people, which is likeable. But the show itself, the show itself was really pretty awful. I mean, the, the audience dropped dramatically, so that within, within a, few, a few days it was a lower audience than the Sunday Herald or, or, my, or my research, you know, it was just it was incredible. And, and yet these people have been brought up as if, as if somehow they can... It's, it's a kind of... It's a colonial thing, isn't it? Yes, it that seems that way. We, we have, these people have been educated south of the border on how to do it properly, how to be real journalists, and so in a moment of stress, when we really need them, we bring them back. And I wonder, what, what, must, what must Jackie and Sally be thinking at that point? I actually emailed Jackie and Sally, Jackie Bird and Sally Magnuson. But he knows them as Jackie and no. Sally. That's just cool. He knows Noam <laughs> Chomsky no, as well. It's they won't they speak to me. They won't speak to me, I'm sure. Okay. But I emailed them both at the time of the Commonwealth Games and said, listen, vote yes, and you'll be able to present the next big event. Because they've been <coughs> replaced. I thought, astonishing. Are, are they not capable of presenting Commonwealth Games? Maybe they've got too much of an accent from you know the received pronunciation population. We have to have it filtered through certain tones. Do you think that was the, the reason? I have no idea. I think it's cultural colonialism. It's it, colonialism. It's, it's an yeah. opinion, but yeah. you know, I'm not the expert. You are. That's right. But the, I mean, they, both, both of them come across to my mind as, as favouring the no campaign and the way they interview Salmon. A very aggressive interviewing a Salmon. I may be wrong. I may be wrong. I don't know how Jackie Bird. Or Jackie Salmon. Bird came in for a lot of stick on Twitter for that. There was a number of people. Raymond Buchanan and Derek Bateman came to her defence. I, I I just don't think it was. I just thought it was an appalling interview. I don't think uh, uh, the defences were merited either, to be honest with you. No. no. But so no, th there was always a watching eye, and there yeah. was always commentary. It just wasn't given any mainstream attention. I mean, it's it's, a, it's an odd an odd thing to note that there's a, a major institution in Scotland who commands a lot of attention, which is completely disrespect. Well, in large quarters, is completely disrespected. It, well, it, it clearly is, and by the, the evidence online is is that there is a very significant body of discontent. With, with the BBC, but the, the, the rallying to the support of the BBC and also the hesitance from, from, the, hesitance from the SNP, for example. Uh, John Swinney, on, on one of these debates, was asked directly, was the, did he think the BBC was biased? And he wouldn't answer the question. And we've had, we've had, we've had very recently, we've had uh, Blair Jenkins saying, just, just last night and today, saying the BBC is not systemically biased against, or was not systemically biased, there's a subtle point here, uh, systemically biased against the ES campaign. Throw out the subtlety for me, because I don't get Well, it. I think what he's saying is, that he, he's saying that there's nothing in the, BBC, in, in the BBC's performance that has to produce bias, that's something that's deep in the heart of it and planned. And by systemic, I think he, I think he imagines the, a cabal of top top officials saying, you know, gathered around a cauldron, how can we undermine the ES campaign? This sort of thing. And he set up a kind of straw man there. I don't know of any critic who thinks the BBC operates a conspiracy to undermine the RDS campaign. I think they did undermine the ES campaign, but I don't think for a minute it took a conspiracy. Uh -huh. I think it's, this, what we have is, is interlocking elites, as Chomsky would call them, people who are paid a lot of money to manage the media, who know and, and mix socially and through their children's education um, with members of other elites. They act in their own interests, and their own interests are the interests of that elite. And so, by the sense, by the sense of their presence in the BBC, people below them in the system sense what they want. The and they work set, towards the ethos is set. So it's so a de facto. You, yes, I mean, pe people laugh when you compare it with Nazi Germany, but 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 I'm going to do it because because the best example is called the Führer principle in some ways. Mm -hmm. Not no, the Führer effect, not the Führer principle. Which is that is that Hitler didn't tell anyone what to do. People further down the system thought, "What does he want?" Yeah, and they worked towards him. So junior reporters think, "What does the reporter above me or the editor want?" And they write to that. They self censor, and they the, and then the, the senior reporters work towards the editor. The editor works towards the owner, 
or they work towards the, 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 the board chief executive of the board and so and the on. Yeah. So you end up with consensus, but it's not top down. It's self-censored. Self-policing. Yeah. Absolutely. And so that's and how the BBC is biased. It doesn't require to be systemic. Okay. Uh, uh, so the BBC is biased. It doesn't require to be systemic because it's inherent in, in the people who populate it to a certain extent. Yes. Unfortunately, we're coming towards the, the end of the show. We've, we've covered a wee bit of Heidegger, phenomenology, <laughs> solipsism, existentialism, Nazism, um, Pravda, Chomskyisms, and various other places in between. Professor John Robertson, Prof was sorry, it's been absolutely wonderful. I've well, loved every minute of it, I genuinely have. So well, thank you very, very much indeed. Well, I've enjoyed it myself. Great, been tremendous. Great to have you, thank you. So that's it for Referendum TV today. Um, with Professori John John Maybe Robertson. You should explain that Professori. Professori, he was called that by a by a Bass Bass. television crew. Um, so I do apologise to contextualise that. But thank you very much from uh, Referendum TV. We'll be back with you shortly. Thank you. Bye bye.